Chapter 1 of The Empty Sack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Empty Sack by Basil King. Chapter 1. And Mr. Collingham will see you in his office before you go. Having thus become the voice of fate, Miss Ruddick, shirt-waisted and daintily shod, slipped away between the pens where clerks were preening themselves before leaving their desks for the day. The old man to whom she had spoken raised his head in the mild surprise of an ox disturbed while grazing. He, too, was leaving his desk for the day, arranging his work with the tidy care of one for whom pens, ink, and ledgers were the vital things of life. Finishing his task, his hand trembled. His smile trembled, too, when a young man in a neighbouring pen called out in tones which mingled sarcasm with encouragement, "'Good luck, old top! Going to get your raise at last!' It was what he repeated to himself as he shuffled after Miss Ruddick. He was obliged to repeat it in order to steady his step. He was obliged to steady his step because some fifteen or twenty pairs of eyes from all the pens in the office were following him as he went along. It was the last bit of pride in the man marching up to face the firing squad. He had reached the glass door on which the word EXIT could be traced in reversed letters, when a breezy young fellow of twenty startled him by a sudden clap on the shoulder. The boy had not come from a pen, but from the more distant portion of the bank, where a line of teller's cages faced the public. "'Hello, Dad. Tell Ma I'll be home for supper. Off now for a plunge at the gym.' The boy passed on, leaving behind a vision of gleaming teeth and the echo of gay tones. Opening the glass door and entering a passageway, the old man stumbled along it till another door, standing open, showed Miss Ruddick, beside her typewriter, assorting her papers before going home. Miss Ruddick was a competent woman of thirty-five. She was, in her present position of stenographer secretary to the head of the banking-house, because Mr. Bickley, the efficient expert for whose opinion Mr. Collingham had a kind of reverence, had selected her for the job. Miss Ruddick cultivated her efficiency as another woman cultivates her voice, or another her gift for dancing. Throwing off the weaknesses that spring from affection and softness of heart, she had steeled and oiled herself into a swiftly working, surely judging, and wholly impersonal business automaton. Ten years ago she would have felt sorry for a man in Josiah Follett's predicament. She would have felt sorry for him now, had she not learned to her cost that sympathy diminished the accuracy of her work. Now she could turn him off as easily as an executioner, the man condemned to death. As a matter of fact, she knew that ten minutes previously the efficiency expert had been closeted with Mr. Collingham, dealing with this very case. With her own ears she had heard Mr. Bickley say, "'You will do as you think best, Mr. Collingham. "'Only I can't help reminding you that once you've met any principle but that of supply and demand, "'business methods are at an end.' "'Miss Ruddick knew Mr. Collingham's inner struggle because she'd been through it herself. "'But she knew, too, that to Mr. Collingham the efficiency expert was much what his physician is to a king. "'His advice may be distasteful, but it is a command. "'The most merciful thing now was rapidity of action.' as with the application of the guillotine. It was mercy, therefore, to throw open instantly the door of Mr. Collingham's office, so that Josiah was forced to enter. He stood meekly, feeling, doubtless, as the psalmist felt when all the ends of the world had come upon him. Confusedly he was saying to himself that all the threads of his laborious life, from the time when, as a boy in Canada, he had begun to earn his living at sixteen, till now, when he was sixty-three, had been drawn together at just this point, where he was either to get his raise or else. The suspense was terrible. As the august presence, into which he had been ushered, was engaged in examining the contents of a lower drawer of the flat-topped desk at which it was seated, it was only partly visible. All desire could see was the shoulder of a portly form, the edge of a pear-shaped pearl in a plum-coloured tie, and a temple of grizzled hair. The clerk moved forward, coming to a halt midway between the door and the desk, till the presence should recognise his approach by raising its head. The presence didn't quite raise its head. It merely glanced upward in a casual sidelong way, continuing the inspection of the drawer. "'Well, Follett, I suppose you know what I've got to say.' 
Holly to portray the fact that he did know. "'Is it the same as you said two years ago, sir?' Thus challenged, the presence lifted itself, becoming to the full Bradley Collingham, the distinguished banker, philanthropist, and American citizen, so widely and favourably known for his sympathetic personality. The essence of these traits rang in the appealing quality of his tone. "'What do you think, Follett? I told you then that you were not earning your salary. You haven't been earning it since. What can I do?' "'I could work harder, sir. I could stay over time when none of the young fellows want to.' "'Ah, that wouldn't do any good, Follett. It isn't the way we do business.' "'I've been five years with you, sir, and all my life between one banking-house and another, in this country and Canada. In my humble way I've helped to build the banking business up.' "'And you've been paid, haven't you? I really don't see that you've anything to complain of.' There was no severity in this response. It was made only because the necessities of the case required it, as Follett had the justice to perceive. "'I'm not complaining, sir. I—' only don't see how I'm going to live. The voice, already distressed, became more so. But that isn't my affair, is it, now? I'm running a business, not a charitable institution. It isn't as if you've been with us twenty or thirty years. You've shifted about a good deal in your time. I've, I've had to better myself, sir, with a family. Quite so. Once you've made any principle but that of supply and demand, business methods are at an end. Don't think that this isn't as hard for me as it is for you, Follett, but— "'If it was as hard for you, sir, as it is for me, sir, you'd—' "'But the possibilities here being dangerous. "'The banker was forced to cut in. "'Besides, you'll get another job. "'Stairs will write you any kind of recommendation you ask for.' "'Recommendations won't do me any good, sir, once I'm fired for old age. "'That's a worse brand on you than coming out of jail.' "'The discussion growing painful, the banker rose to put an end to it. "'Even so, he had something still to say to justify himself.' "'It isn't as if I haven't warned you of this, Follett. "'You've had two years in which—' "'It was hard to find the right phrase— "'in which to provide for your future.' "'The clerk was unable to repress a dim, far-away smile. Two years in which to provide for my future, on forty-five a week, "'and me with five mouths to feed, to, to say nothing of Teddy, who pays his board?' "'The banker found an opening.' "'I made a place for him, didn't I, now, as soon as he was released from the Navy? "'He ought to be able to help you.' "'He does help, sir, as far as the young fellow can, on eighteen a week, "'with his own expenses to take care of. "'But I've two little girls still at school, and another, my eldest—' "'A hint of embarrassment emphasised the banker's words "'as he began moving forward to show his visitor to the door. "'I understand that she's engaged as an artist's model. "'That, too, ought to bring you in something.' "'I suppose Mr. Robert told you that, sir.' This was inadvertent on Follett's part, and a mistake. Any other distinguished man would have stiffened at the use of the name of a member of his family in a connection like the present one. Bradley Collingham was admirably temperate in saying, "'I don't talk of such matters with my son. I merely understand that your eldest girl was earning something. "'She poses six hours a week for Mr. Hubert Ray at, at a dollar an hour.' She could probably get more engagements. I hear, I forget who told me, that she's the type these artist people like to put into their pictures. Finding himself obliged to keep step with his employer, Follett felt as if he was walking to his soul's dead march. Only the force of the conventions in which everybody lives enabled him to go on making conversation. We don't much like the occupation for a daughter of ours, sir, and, and besides there's lots who think that being an artist model isn't respectable. "'Still, if she can earn good money at it—' To Collingham's relief, they were at the door, which he opened significantly and without more words. Follett looked into the outer world, as represented by Miss Ruddick's office, as into an abyss. For the minute it seemed too awful a void to step into. When his watery blue eyes again sought Collingham's face, it was with the dumb question, "'Must I?' which of the banker himself could only meet with Mr. Bickley's manfulness. He, too, spoke only with his eyes. "'You must, my poor Follett. There's no help for it. You and I are both caught up into a vast machine. I can't act otherwise than as I'm doing, and I know you don't expect it.' Thus Follett stepped over the threshold, and the door closed behind him. So short a time had passed since he had gone the other way that Miss Ruddick was still behind her desk, putting away her papers. 
for it didn't look at her, but she looked at him, finding herself compelled to hark back to Mr. Bickley's axioms to check the tears she couldn't allow to rise. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of The Empty Sack》by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers.《Chapter Two. Meanwhile, there was that going on on which would have disturbed both these elderly men had they known anything about it. Jenny Follett, in a Greek peplum of white cotton cloth, her amber-coloured hair drawn into a loose Greek knot, was on her knees before a plaster cast of Aphrodite, to which she was holding up a garland of tissue paper flowers. While there was nothing alarming in this pagan act, the freedom with which two young men laid hands on her little person threw out hints of impropriety. The pretexts were obvious, and, in the case of one of the young men, were backed up by what it might have been called professional necessity. One bare arm needed to be raised, the other to be lowered. One sandaled foot was too visible beneath the edge of the peplum, the other not visible enough. Adjustments called for readjustments, and readjustments for revisions of the scheme. What one young man approved of, the other disallowed, to a running accompaniment of Miss Follett's laughter. "'Do go away,' she implored, when Mr. Bob Collingham, with one hand beneath her elbow and the other at her fingertips, tilted her arm at what seemed to him its loveliest angle. "'Tear out, Bob,' the artist seconded, in half-vexed good humour. "'We'll never get the pose with you here.' "'You'll never get at anything if I went away, because Miss Follett wouldn't work, would you, Miss Follett?' The artist, having gone in search of something at the far end of the studio, Miss Follett replied to Mr. Collingham alone. "'I don't know what I'd do if you went away. But if you stay, I shall go frantic. If you touch me again, I shall get up.' "'I'm not touching you again,' he said, going on to bend her left arm ever so slightly, "'because this is the same old time all along. The picture is all I care about.' "'But it's Mr. Ray's picture. It isn't yours.' "'It will be if I buy it. I said I would if I liked it, and I shan't like it unless I get it the way I want it.' "'You know you don't mean to buy it.' "'I don't mean to let anybody else buy it. You can lay down your life on that.' There was so much earnestness in this declaration that Miss Follett laughed again. It was an easy, silvery laugh, pleasant to the ear, and not out of keeping with the medley of beautiful things round her. Jenny's value in a studio is more than that of a model, Ray had recently confided to his friend Bob Collingham. It's as if she extracted the beauty from every bit of tapestry or bronze and turned it into an animate life. By doing nothing or standing still, Collingham had added, she can pin your eyes on her as other girls can't by frisking about. And when she moves... An exclamation from Ray conveyed the fact that Jenny's motion was beyond what either of these young experts in womanhood could possibly put into words. But that Jenny knew where to draw a certain kind of line became evident when, either by inadvertence or design, the back of Bob Collingham's hand rubbed along her cheek. With a smile at once kindly and cold, she put away his arm and rose. In the few yards she placed between them before she turned again, still with her kind, cold smile, there was rebuke without offence. Being fair, the young man coloured easily. When he coloured, the three inches of scar across his temple which he had brought home from the war became a streak of red. It was one of the reasons why Jenny, who was sensitive to the physical, didn't like to look at him. Not to look at him, she pretended to arrange the folds of her peplum, which kept her gaze downward. But had she looked, she would have seen that he was hurt, his face was of the honest, sympathetic cast that quickly reflects the wounding of the feelings. If men have prototypes in dogs, Bob Colliams would have been the Mastiff or the St. Bernard, big, strong, devoted, slow to wrath, and with an almost comic humiliation at the sound of a harsh word. Though there was no harsh word in Jenny's case, Bob was sure he detected a harsh thought. It hurt him the more for the reason that she was a model, while he had advantages of social consideration. Little as he would have been discourteous to a girl of his own station, he would have thought it unworthy of a cad to profit by Jenny's helplessness in a place like a studio. "'I hope you didn't think I was trying to be fresh.' Now that she felt herself secured by distance, she laughed again. "'I didn't think anything at all. I just—' 
I just don't like people touching me. Not any people? Not any I need speak about to you. Why me? Because I hardly know you. You could know me better if you wanted to do. Oh, I could know lots of people better if I wanted to do. And you don't want to? For what reason? It isn't always a reason. Sometimes it's just an instinct. And which is it in my case? In your case it doesn't have to be discussed. I shouldn't know you, anyhow. We're like creatures in different... What do they call it? Not spheres. Elements, is it? We're like creatures in different elements, a bird and a fish that don't get a point of contact. You may see the points of contact. And when I don't see them, they're not there. She turned towards Ray, who was coming back in their direction, addressing him in the idiom she heard among young and native-born Americans, and which accorded best with her position in the studio. Oh, Mr. Ray, could you let me off posing any more today? This friend Guy of yours has got me all on springs. Clear out, friend Guy. Can't you see you're in the way? She continued to take the tone she was trying to make second nature, since it was not first. That's something he wouldn't notice if a car was running over him. But please let me go. There's a quarter of an hour left on today, but I'll make it up some other time. She moved down the studio with as much seeming unconcern as if she didn't know that two pairs of eyes were following her. Picking her way between old English chairs with canvases stacked against their legs, past dusty brocade hangings, and beneath an occasional plaster cast lifted on a pedestal, she went out at the model's exit, without a glance behind her. Bob spoke only when she disappeared. "'Listen, Hubert, I'm going to marry that girl.' Ray stepped back to the front of the easel, flicking in a touch or two on the rough sketch of the Greek girl kneeling before Aphrodite. "'I was afraid you were getting some such bug in your head.' Bob limped to a table on which he had thrown his hat and the stick that helped his lameness. People at Marillo Park, where the Colliums live for most of the year, said that, with the wounds he had got while in the French army in the early days of the war, he brought back with him a real enhancement of manhood. Having come through Groton and Harvard little better than an uncouth boy, his experience in France had shaped his outlook on life into something like a purpose. It was not very clear as yet, or sharply defined, but he knew that certain preliminary conditions must be met before he could settle down. One of these had to do with Miss Jenny Follett, and what Hubert called a bug in his head was in his own mind at least as vital to his development as his braving his family in going to the war. That had been in the famous year when the American nation was trying to be neutral in thought. "'I'm not neutral in thought,' Bob, who'd only that summer left Harvard, had declared to his father. "'I'm not neutral in any way. Give me my ticket over, Dad, and I'll do the rest myself.' He got his ticket over, and fifteen months later, bandaged and crippled, a ticket back. On the return voyage he had as his companion a young American stretcher man who had helped to carry him off the battlefield— and who, a few weeks later, nervously shattered, had joined him in the hospital. Ray, who on the outbreak of war had been painting in La Toulouse Atelier, had never got what he called a sickener of Europe, and was glad to hang out his shingle in New York. A New England man of Gallicized way of thinking, he had means enough to wait for recognition, so long as he kept his expenses within relatively narrow bounds. With his soft hat plastered provisionally on the back of his head, Bob leaned heavily on his stick. "'I've got to marry someone,' he said, as if in self-defence. "'I'm that kind. I can't begin fitting my jigsaw together until I do it.' Ray kept on painting. "'Why don't you pick out a girl in your own class? Lots of nice ones at Marillo.' "'You don't marry girls just because they're nice, old thing. You take the one who's the other half of yourself.' "'I don't see that you're the other half of Miss Follett.' "'Well, I am. "'Miss Follett herself doesn't think so. "'She'll think so all right when I show her that she can't do without me.' Oh, "'Some job,' Ray grunted laconically. "'Sure, it's some job. "'But the bigger the job, the more you're on your metal. "'That's the way we're made.' "'The artist continued to add small touches to the shadows of the Aphrodite cast "'as he changed his tactics. "'If you marry Miss Follett... "'Wouldn't your family raise hell?' "'Well, they'd raise hell at first, and put a can on it afterward. "'Families always do.' 
and what would Miss Follett feel before they'd put on the can. Bob limped uneasily towards the door. Life wouldn't be all slip and go down for her, of course, but that's what I should have to make up to her. Oh, you'd make it up to her. With his hand on the knob, Collingham turned in mild indignation. Say, but what do you think I'm made of? A girl I'm crazy about. Oh, I only wondered how you were going to do it. Well, wander away. A steely glint came into the deep-set small grey eyes as he added, That's something I don't have to explain to you beforehand, now do I? Left alone, the painter went on painting. As it always does, the house of art opened its door to the troubles of the artist. Ray neither turned his head as his friend went out, nor muttered a farewell. He merely laid on his strokes with an emotional vigour which hardened the surface of the plaster cast into marble. Neither did he turn his head nor utter a greeting when he became aware that Jenny, in her sport suit of tobacco colour set off with collar and cuffs of ruby red, was moving toward him among the studio properties. It was easier to work his desire to look at her into this swift, sure wielding of the brush. In the spirit, rather, than with the eyes, he knew that she passed within ten or twelve feet of him, that her kind, soft, bantering glance was resting on him as he worked, and that a kind, soft, bantering smile was flickering about her lips. With a deft force he found the colours and gave this expression to the mouth and eyes of the kneeling girl. It was the work of a second, the merest twist of the fingers. "'I just wanted to say,' Jenny explained, after waiting for him to see her, "'that I'm sorry to have been so horrid just now, and I'd like to know when I'm to come again.' "'You could marry Bob Collingham if you wanted to.' His efforts had become so passionately living that he couldn't afford to look up at her now, even had he wished to do so. He did not so wish, because he knew, still in the spirit, how she would take this announcement. Without the change of a muscle, without a change of any kind, beyond a flame in the ambed of depths of the irises. It would be a tawny flame, with an indescribable red in it, and he managed, on the instant, to translate it into paint. The girl on her knees was getting a soul as the lumpish white of the plaster cast was taking on the gleam of ancient, long-worshipped stone. "'And would you advise me to do that?' The voice had the charm of the well-placed mezzo, the annunciation a melodious precision. Born in Halifax, where she had spent her first twelve years, the English tradition of musical speech, which in that old fortified town makes its last tottering stand on the American continent, had been part of her inheritance. Still working at his highest pitch of tensity, Ray considered his answer. "'I shouldn't advise you to do that, if I thought about myself.' "'Then why say anything about it?' "'Because I think I ought to put you wise.' "'What's the good of that, when I don't like him?' "'Girls often marry men they don't like, when they have as much money as he'll have.' Money's an object, of course, but when a fellow... He's not so bad. I like him. Most men do. Most men wouldn't have to stand his pawing them about. I like him, too, except for the physical. Then you wouldn't marry him? Not unless it was the only way not to starve to death. But you'll marry someone. Probably. Probably so will you. Her voice was as cool and unflurried as if the words were tossed off without intention. Both knew that an electric change had come into the mental atmosphere. Of the two, the girl was the less perturbed. Though beneath her feet the floor seemed to heave like the deck of a ship in a storm, she could stand in a jaunty attitude, her hands in her ruby-red pockets, and throw up at its sauciest angle her daintily modelled chin. With him it was different. He had two main points to consider. In the first place, Bob Collingham had just made an announcement to which he, Ray, was obliged to give some thought. He didn't need to give much to it, because the conclusions were so obvious. Jenny had hit the poor fellow in the eye, and instead of viewing the case in a common-sense, gallicized way, he was taking it with crazy American solemnity. There was nothing to it. The Colliams would never stand for it. It would be a favour to them, as well as to Bob himself, to put the whole thing out of the question. "'So that settles that,' he said to himself. Because as he continued to reflect, he worked furiously, 
Jenny saw in him the being whom the lingo of the hour had taught her to call a caveman. In the motion picture theatres she generally frequented, cavemen struggled with vampires in duels of passion and strength. Jenny longed to be loved by one of this race, and a caveman who came to her with violet eyes and a sweeping brown moustache possessed an appeal beyond the prehistoric. In spite of the challenge in her smile and the daring angle at which she held her chin, she waited in violent emotion for what he would say next. "'Oh, I shall marry for years to come,' he jerked out, still going on with his work. "'Shan't be able to afford it. If I didn't have a few, a very few hundred dollars a year, I couldn't pay you your miserable six a week.' She took this manfully. The head, with its ruby-red toque, to which a tobacco-coloured wing gave the dash which was part of Jenny's personality, was perhaps poised a little more audaciously, but there was no other sign outside the wildness of her heart. "'Oh, well, you're only beginning your career as yet. One of these days you'll do a big portrait. But, Jenny, marriage isn't everything.' It was the caveman's plea, the caveman's tone, and though Jenny knew she couldn't respond to it in practice, the depths of her being thrilled. "'No, it isn't everything. But for a girl like me it's so much that—' "'Why, especially for a girl like you?' "'Because her ring and her marriage lines are about all she's got to show. "'No woman can hold a man for more than, well, just so long, "'and when his heart's gone where she is, poor thing, except for the ring and the parson's name. "'A woman's heart is as free as a man's, and, and when he goes his way, "'she's left standing in the same old place. "'We'd all be better off if we felt as free to wander as the men. "'But most of us are made so that we don't want to. "'God, what a life!' she moaned with a comic grimace to take the pain from the exclamation. "'But tell me, Mr. Ray, what day do you want me to come again?' he asked, as if casually. "'Why do you say, God, what a life?' "'Oh, I don't know. I suppose because it's the only thing to say. Wouldn't you say it if—' "'If what?' "'Oh, nothing.' "'Is it anything to do with me?' "'No, not specially. It's everything, beginning with being born.' "'I shouldn't think you had any kick against being born with a face and a figure like yours.' "'What good are they to me? My mother used to be—well, I'm only pretty, and she was a great beauty. But look at her now.' "'But you don't have to go the same way.' "'All women of our class go the same way. It's awful to spend your whole life toiling and aching and worrying and scraping and paring just on the hither side of starving to death. And yet, if it was only yourself— you could stand it. But when you see that your father and mother did it before you, and that your children will have to do it after you— "'Not in this country, Jenny,' he put in sententiously. "'This country gives everyone a chance.' She gave another of her comic little moans. "'This country is like every other country. It's a football field. If you're big enough and tough enough, with skin padded and conscience wadded and legs to kick hard enough, you get a chance. Yes, and one man in a hundred thousand is able to make use of it. But if you're just a decent, honest sort, willing to do a decent, honest day's work, your only chance will be to keep at it till you drop. Aren't you rather pessimistic? She ignored this question to pace up and down with little tossings of the hands, which Ray found infinitely graceful. Look at my father! He's worked like a convict all his life, just to read the magnificent top-notch of forty-five a week. We've been praying to God to give him a raise. And perhaps God will. She snapped her fingers. Like that he will. God has no use for the prayers of the decent, honest sort. He's on the side of the football tough, with the biggest kitty in the scrimmage. And what's the use? I'm born, and I've got to make the best of it. Tell me when to come again, and let me go. Laying aside his brushes and palette, he went close to her. All the poetry in the world seemed to Jenny to vibrate in his tones. "'Making the best of it, because you're born, is loving and letting yourself be loved, Jenny.' "'So it is,' she laughed with a ring of the desperate in her mirth. "'You don't have to tell me that.' His voice sank to a whisper. "'Then why not do it?' I would like a shot if I had any myself to think about. In love there are only two to think about, Jenny. She laughed, a hard little laugh, in spite of its silvery tinkle. 
when I love, I've got two sisters and a brother, all younger than myself, to bring into the little affair, to say nothing of a nice old dad, and a mother that I'm very fond of. I've got to love for them as well as for myself. Then why don't you love Bob Collingham? She threw him a reproachful look. Don't, please don't, that's brutal of you. But then you are brutal, aren't you? I suppose if you were I shouldn't little nondescript gesture expressed her thought better than she could have put it into words. And, with this tribute to the caveman, she slipped away again amid the brocades, pedestals, and old furniture. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Empty Sack by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 3 Murillo Park, New York, is more than a park, it is a life. When a social correspondent registers the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Robert Bradley Collingham, Miss Edith Collingham, and Mr. Robert Bradley Collingham, Jr., have arrived at Collingham Lodge, Murillo Park, from their camp in the Adirondacks, their farm in Dutchess County, or their apartment in Fifth Avenue, the implications are beyond any that can be set forth in cold print. Cold print will tell you that a man has died, but it can convey no adequate notion of the haven of peace into which presumably he has entered. Cold print might describe Murillo Park as it might describe Warwick Castle or the Chateau of Chenonceau, with a catalogue of landscapes and architectural minutiae. It could tell you of charming houses set in artfully laid out grounds, of gardens, shrubberies, and tennis courts of the club, the swimming pool, the riding school, the golf links. But only experience could give you that sense of being beyond contact with outside vulgarity, which is Marillo's speciality. Against its high stone wall, outside vulgarity breaks as the sea against a cliff. Before its beautiful grill gate, it swells like a river at the foot of a lawn, with no possibility of overflow. As nearly as may be on earth, the resident of Marillo Park can be barricaded against the sordid, and withdrawn from all things inharmonious with his own high thought. But every Eden has its serpent, and at Collingham Lodge on that October afternoon, this Satan had taken the form of a not very good-looking young man, who was pacing the flagged terrace side by side with Miss Edith Collingham. I emphasise the fact that he was not good-looking, for the reason that, in his role of Satan, it was an added touch of the diabolic. Tall, thin, and stormy-eyed, his knife-like features were streaked with dark shadows which seemed to fall in the wrong places in his face. When it is further said that he was a young professor of political economy in a nearby university, without a penny or much prospect in the world, it will easily be seen how devilish a creature he was to have crept into such a paradise. He had crept in by means of being occasionally invited by young Sidebottom, whose family had the next estate to Collingham Lodge. Walls and hedges being unknown at Murillo, the lawns melted into one another, with no other hint of demarcation than could be sketched by clumps of shrubs or skilfully scattered trees. You could be off the Collingham grounds and on to those of the Sidebottoms without knowing you had crossed a boundary. Between trees and shrubs you could slip from the one place to the other, and not be seen from either. "'She might meet him a thousand times, and you and I wouldn't know it,' Mrs. Collingham pointed out to her husband when her suspicions were first roused. "'All she's got to do is to go round that lilac bush, and she might do anything.' True, which the mere chances of that hospitality without which Murillo could not be Murillo would throw together any two young persons minded so to come. In such spacious freedom an ineligible young professor could touch the hem of the garments of a banker's daughter without forcing the issue in any way. With the conversation between Miss Edith Collingham and Professor Ernest Ayling, we have almost nothing to do. It is enough to say that, from the rapidity of the young pair's movements and the animation of their gestures, Mrs. Collingham judged that they were very much in earnest. Looking out from what was known as the Terrace Drawing-Room, she was convinced that no two young people could talk like that without an understanding between them. She had been led to the terrace drawing-room by the sound of voices and the fact that it was the end of the house toward the side-bottom's premises. 
against a background of cannas, dahlias, and gladioli, with maples flinging their flame and crimson up into a golden sky. The two figures passing and repassing the long French windows were little more than silhouettes. Such scraps of their phrases as drifted her way told her that they were up to nothing more criminal than settling the affairs of a distracted universe, but she had no intention that they should settle anything. At the appropriate moment, she decided to make her presence felt. In doing this, she was supported by the knowledge that her presence was a presence to be felt impressively. Of her profile, it was mere economy of effort to say that it was like a cameo, aristocratically regular and clear-cut. Her hair, prematurely white, lent itself to the simplest dressing, too classic to be a mode. A figure, of which it would have been vulgar to use the word plump, carried the most sumptuous costumes with regal suitability. Studied, polished, and perfected, she wore her finish as a mask that concealed the lioness mother which she was. It was the lioness mother who confronted the young couple as they turned in their promenade. Edith alone came forward. Her professor, being given a bow so cold that it was tantamount to a dismissal, as a dismissal was obliged to take it. Within a minute he was down both the flowered terraces and out of sight behind the lilac bush. Mrs. Collings' renunciation had the exquisite precision of the rest of her personality. "'I thought I asked you, dear, not to encourage that impossible young man to come here.' "'But I can't stop his coming without encouragement, can I, Mother Darling?' Mother Darling moved to the edge of the flagged pavement, looking down on the blaze of summer's final fireworks. On each of the two lower terraces fountains played, their back drops falling onto the water-lilies in the basins. It being the moment for a strong appeal, she sounded the first note without turning round. "'Edith, I wonder if you have the faintest idea of a mother's ambitions for her children.' Instinct had taken her to the root of the whole difference between the two generations in the family. Instinct took Edith to the same spot in her reply. "'I think I have. But on the other hand, I wonder if a mother has the faintest idea of her children's ambitions for themselves.' Following an outflanking movement, Mrs. Collingham threw her line a little farther. "'It's curious how, as your father and I approach middle age, we feel that you and Bob are going to disappoint us.' "'I'm sure I speak for Bob as well as for myself when I say that we wouldn't disappoint you willingly. It's only that the things we want are so different. Ours, your father's and mine, are simple and natural. That's the way Bob's and mine seem to us.' She was in a tennis costume, carelessly worn and not very fresh. A weather-beaten Panama pulled down to shade her eyes gave a touch of cowboy picturesqueness to an ensemble already picturesque rather than pretty or beautiful. Leaning nonchalantly against the high carved back of a teakwood chair, the figure had a leopard grace to which the owner seemed indifferent. Indifference, boredom, dissatisfaction focused the expression of the delicate, irregular features to a wistful longing as far as possible from the mother's brisk self-approval. All this was emphasised by a pair of restless, intelligent eyes, of which one was blue and the other brown. The mother turned round with an air of expostulation. "'I'm sure I can't see what you want to make of your life. You seem to have no ideals, not any more than Bob. You're not pretty, but you're not ugly. And you've a kind of witchiness most pretty girls have to do without— if you'd only dress with some decency and make the best of yourself, you could take as well as any other girl. Yes, if the game is worth the candle. But surely some game is worth the candle. Oh, certainly. Only not this one of taking in the way you seem to think girls want to take. Some girls do. Oh, some girls, of course. Only not, not my kind. But what is your kind? That's what I can't understand. The girl smiled a dim, distant, rather wistful smile that merely fluttered on the lips and died like a feeble light. "'And that's what I can't explain to you, Mother Darling.' "'Are we so far apart as that?' "'We're not far apart at all. It's only that I'm myself, while you want me to be a continuation of you.' "'I don't want anything but what will make for your happiness.' "'My happiness as you see it for me, not as I see it for myself.' 
"'But you're my child, Edith. I, I can't be without hopes for you.' Another dim, quickly dying smile was the only answer to this, as Edith picked up her racket from the teakwood chair and moved towards the house. On a note that would have been plaintive had it not been so restrained, Mrs. Collingham continued, "'Edith, darling, I don't think there's been a moment since you were born when I haven't dreamed of a brilliant future for you now. But, oh, mother dear, what's the use of a brilliant future, as you call it, when your whole soul is set on something else?' The lioness mother was roused. "'But it shouldn't be set on something else. That's what I resent.' "'Don't think for a minute that your father and I mean to stand by and see you throw yourself away.' "'I didn't know there was any question of my doing that.' "'That boy will never be anything better than a university professor, never in this world. "'And if it comes to our forbidding it, forbid it we shall, without hesitation.' The girl's head was flung up. Boredom and indifference passed out of the strange eyes. For an instant the conflict of wills seemed about to break out into mutual challenge. It was Edith who first regained enough mastery of self to say, quietly, "'You surely wouldn't take that responsibility, whatever I did.' The soft answer having warned the mother of the danger of collision, she subsided to an easier, if a more fretful, tone. "'And Bob's such a worry, too. If your father knew about this foddit girl, I think he would go wild.' "'But we don't know anything ourselves.' beyond the few hints dropped by Hubert Ray, which I'm sure he didn't mean. Well, I'm worried. It's the war, I suppose. If he'd only settle down to work. He won't settle down till he marries, and if he marries it will have to be some girl he's in love with. If he were to marry a girl of that class— Girl of what class? What's the good word? Mrs. Collingham turned on her son, who stood on the threshold of one of the French windows. "'We're talking about men and women marrying outside of their own class, Bob, "'and I was trying to say how fatal it was.' "'Good Lord! Mother, do people still think like that? "'I thought they'd rung the bells on them even at Murillo. "'Wasn't it one of the things we fought for in the war, "'to wipe out the lines of caste?' "'But not to wipe out ideals, Bob. "'What fathers and mothers have worked to build up their sons fought to maintain?' "'Max!' The police dog puppy, who had been poking his nose between Bob's legs, now squeezed his vigorous person through the opening and came out on the terrace joyously. Wagging his powerful tail and sniffing about each of the ladies in turn, he seemed to be saying, "'Don't you see that I am here? Now cheer up, everybody, and let's have a good time.' Bob made a feint at seconding this invitation. Going up to his mother, he slipped an arm round her waist and kissed her. "'Old lady, your years behind the times!' What fathers and mothers built turned out to be a rotten old world which they've handed to us to bolster up. We're tackling the job as well as we can, but you must give us a free hand. Releasing herself from his embrace, she stood with an air of authority. If giving you a free hand means looking on at the frustration of our hopes, you'll have to learn, Bob, that your father and mother still have some of the energy that placed you where you are. Of course you've placed us where we are, mother dear. Edith agreed pacifically. But that's just the point. Because we are where you've paced us, we're crazy to go on to something else. Isn't that the way of life, the perpetual struggle for what we haven't got? Because you and your father didn't have a big house and a big position to begin with, you worked till you got them. Bob and I were born to them, and so— It's this way, old lady, Bob broke in. All your generation had bigness on the brain— it was a kind of disease, like the water that swells a baby's head. They used to think it was a specifically American disease, till they found out it was English, French, and every other old thing. The whole lot of you puffed up till the earth hadn't room for you, and you made the war to push one another off. I didn't make the war, Bob. I've never been anything but a poor mother, striving and praying for her children. Well, you did push one another off to the tune of ten or twelve millions, most of the young. Since then the universal disease of swelled head is being got under control, as they say of epidemics. Only the leftovers catch it still, and Edith and I aren't that. Hardly any one of our age is. We just don't take the germ. Not that we blame you and your lot, old lady. Thanks, Bob. Oh, don't thank me, I'm just telling you. And the point of your homily is— 
that our generation all over the world has got out of Murillo Park. Murillo Park is a back number. It's as out of date as the hat you wore five years ago. You can give it away to the poor because the poor don't wear that kind of thing, and the rich have gone on to a new fashion. Listen, old lady, the thing I'd hate worst of all for Dad and you is to see you left behind, trying to put over the footlights a lot of old gags that the audience swallowed in its time, but which don't get a laugh any more. The actor who tried to do that is passé forever. If you keep to English, Bob, I should understand you a little better. Bob grew excited, laying down the law on the palm of his left hand with the forefinger of the right, while Max, all a-quiver, scored the points with his terrific tail. I'll not only keep to English, but I'll tell you the line to take if you want to remain the up-to-date, bright-as-a-button old lady you are. I should be grateful. Then here goes. Take a long breath, keep your wig on, put your feet in plaster casts so as not to cake. He summoned his forces to speak strongly. If Edith was to pick out a man she wanted to marry, and I was to pick out a girl, no matter who, it would be the chic new stuff for father and you. But the chic new stuff for father and her was not laid down on the palm of the hand, for the reason that a portly shadow was seen to move within the dimness of the drawing-room. At the same time, Max's joy was stifled by the appearance on the terrace of Dauphin, the Irish setter, who was consciously the dog en titre of the master of the house. Mrs. Collingham composed herself. Edith picked up a tennis ball from the flags and jumped it on her racket. Bob put a cigarette in his mouth and struck a match. It was the unwritten law of the family not to risk intimate discussion before a tribunal too august. Once he had reached the terrace, it was plain that Collingham was tired. His shoulders were hunched, his walk had no spring in it. "'I'm all in,' he sighed, sinking into the teakwood chair. "'Poor father!' Edith dropped a hand on his shoulder. He drew it down to his lips and kissed it. "'You'd like your tea, wouldn't you?' The solicitude was his wife's. "'We were just going to have it. Bob, do find gossip and tell him to bring it here.' Bob limped into the house and out again. By the time he had returned, his father was saying, "'Yes, it's been a trying day. Among other things, I've had to dismiss old Follett.' "'The devil you have!' The exclamation was so heartfelt as to turn all eyes on the young man. "'Why, Bob, dear?' his mother asked, craftily. "'What difference does it make to you?' Bob did his best to recapture a position he was not yet ready to abandon. "'It may not make any difference to me, but—but but how is he going to live?' "'Is that your responsibility?' Edith came to her brother's rescue. "'It's someone's responsibility, mother.' "'Then let someone shoulder it. Bob doesn't have to saddle himself with it unless—' Convinced that, in the presence of his father, his mother wouldn't speak too openly, Bob felt safe in a challenge. "'Yes, mother, unless what?' Mother and son exchanged a long look. "'Unless you go very far out of your way.' "'Or well, suppose I did go very far out of my way.' "'I should have to leave it to your father to deal with that.' "'Well, it wouldn't be the first time Dad's been philanthropic.' Collingham looked up wearily. He was sitting with one leg thrown across the other, his left hand stroking Dauphin's silky head. "'You can be as philanthropic as you like outside business, Bob,' he said, with schooled, hopeless conviction. "'Inside it's no go. Once you admit the principle of teaching your employees philanthropically, business methods are at an end.' "'I don't think modern economics would agree with you, Daddy,' Deeds objected. "'Aren't we beginning to realise that the well-being of employees, even when they're no longer of much use?' Collium looked up with a kind of longing in his eyes. "'I wish I could believe that, Edie. But an efficiency expert wouldn't bear you out.' "'An efficiency expert doesn't know everything. He studies nothing but the individual private, whereas a political economist knows what's going on all up and down the line.' To Collingham, this was like the doctrine of the universal salvation to a Calvinist theologian. He would have seized it had he dared, but for daring it was too late. He had trained himself otherwise.' On a basis of expert advice and individual efficiency, Collingham of Laws had been built up. 
All he could do was to grasp at the personal. "'Where did you hear that?' "'You can read all about it in Mr. Ailing's last book, The Economic Value of Goodwill.' As she passed through the French window into the house, her mother turned with a gesture of both outspread hands. "'There, you see, what did I tell you? She has the effrontery to read his books and name him openly.' But, too dispirited to take up the gauntlet, Collingham looked with welcome toward Gossip, who appeared in the doorway with the tea. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of *The Empty Sack* by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. • Chapter Four. The Follets came together every evening about six, chiefly by the process known to American cities as commuting. Commuting brought them to number eleven, Indiana Avenue, Pemberton Heights. Seen from the New York riverfront, Pemberton Heights, on top of a great cliff on the New Jersey side of the Hudson suggests a battlemented parapet. By day its outline is a fringe against the sky. By night its clustering lights are like a constellation. Indiana Avenue is one of those rare spots in the neighbourhood of New York where a measure of beauty is still reserved for the relatively poor. The heights are too high for the railways to scale, too inconvenient for factories. The not very well-to-do can find shelter there, as the medieval peoples of the Mediterranean coast found it in the rock towns where the pirates couldn't follow them. It is hardly conceivable that industry will ever climb to this uncomfortable perch, or that much competition will put up rents. Too inaccessible for the social rich, and too isolated for the still more social poor, Pemberton Heights is the refuge of those who don't mind the trouble of getting there for the sake of the compensation. The compensation is largely in the way of air and panorama. Both have a tendency to take away your breath. You would hardly believe that so much of New York could be visible all at once. The gigantic profile of Manhattan is sketched in here with a single stroke, while the river is thronged like a busy street seen from the top of a tower. City smoke rolls up and ocean mist rolls in while you're looking on. Sunrise, moonrise. Moonset, sunset, stars in the heaven and lights along the darkened waterway afford to the not very well-to-do, cooped up all day in kitchens, offices and factories, a morning and evening glimpse into the ecstatic. Number 11 was somewhat withdrawn from all this towards the middle of the plateau. Built at a period when an architect's ambition was chiefly to do something singular, it had a great deal of sloping roof, with windows where he would not expect them. Pemberton Heights been held up bravely to rain and snow, the colour of the house was a weather-beaten brown. Two hydrangea trees, shaped like open umbrellas, and covered now with white blossoms fading to rose, stood one on each side of the front door, in the centre of two tiny grass-plots. There was a piazza, of course, where most of the family leisure was passed, and in the yard behind the house there stood a cherry-tree. All up and down the street for the length of about half a mile were similar little houses, each with its piazza and its architectural oddity, homes of the not very well-to-do, content with their relative poverty. Among themselves they formed a society as distinct and as active as that of Marylow Park, and out of it they got as much pleasure as the Sybottoms and Collinghams from their more exclusive foregatherings. In this soil, the Follets had taken root with the ease of transportation of the Anglo-Saxon race. Drawn to Pemberton Heights by the presence there of other Canadians, Josiah had bought the little house for seven thousand dollars. On this he had paid four, which it was his ruling desire to pay off. The mild, tenacious optimism of his nature convinced him he should be able to do this, in spite of the danger of being fired hanging over him for two years. The fact that, though the months kept passing, that sword didn't fall, inspired the belief that it never would. He had grown so sure of this that with regard to the warning issued by Collingham he had never taken his wife into his confidence. For one thing it was useless to alarm her when it might not be without a cause, and for another. But that was the secret tragedy of Josiah's life. 
he had not made good the promise he gave when Lizzie Scarborough married him, and the falling of the sword would be the final proof of it. It would mean that his whole patient, painstaking life had fitted him for nothing better than the scrap heap. That he should come to such an end he couldn't believe possible. That after nearly fifty years of uncomplaining drudgery he should be flung aside as useless to man in general, and worse than useless to his family, was not, he argued, in keeping with the will of God. It was to the will of God he trusted more than to the mercy of Bradley Collingham, though he trusted to them both. When he married Lizzie, in the little town of Lisgar, Nova Scotia, he'd been a bank clerk. A bank clerk in Canada is a kind of young nobleman at the beginning of what may be a striking career, after the manner of a fledgling in diplomacy. The banking institutions being few and large, the employees are moved from post to post, much like attaches or army officers. As moves bring promotion, the clerk becomes a teller, and the teller a cashier, and the cashier a branch manager, and the branch manager a wealthy man in touch with worldwide issues. It was the kind of progress Josiah had expected when he married Lizzie Scarborough, the kind of future they dreamed of and talked about, and which never came. Josiah lacked something. You couldn't put your finger on the floor in his energy, but you knew it was there. He was moved about, of course, but with little or no promotion. Other men got that, but he was ignored. Harem scarum young fellows whose ignorance of bookkeeping was a scandal were lifted over his head, while he and Lizzie stared at each other in perplexity. Hardest of all for him was that, as years went by, Lizzie herself lost belief in him. More tender with him for his failure, she nevertheless saw that he was not the man she supposed in the gay young days at Liscar, and he saw that she saw. She gave up the hope of promotion before he did. The best to which they came to a spa was a raise. It was bitter for Lizzie because, as she was fond of saying to herself, and now and then to the children, she had been born a lady. This was no more than the truth. Whatever the meaning given to the word, Lizzie fulfilled it, though her claims were more than moral ones. The Scarboroughs had been great people in Massachusetts before the Revolution. The old Scarborough mansion, still standing in Cambridge, bears witness to the generous scale on which they lived. But they left it as it stood, with its pictures, its silver, its furniture, its stores, rather than break their tie with England. Scorned by the country from which they fled, and ignored by that to which they remained true, their history on Nova Scotian soil was chiefly one of dissent. A few of them prospered, a few reached high positions in the adopted land, but most of them lacked opportunity, as well as the will, to create it. True, Lizzie's father was a clergyman, but her sisters married poorly. Her brothers dropped into any chance jobs that came their way, while she herself got only such fulfilment of her dreams as she found at Pemberton Heights. Even the move to New York, which Josiah had made when convinced that the Bank of the Maritime Provinces held no further hope for him, had not greatly prospered them. Five years of drifting between one bank and another were followed by five steady years with Collingham and Law. But even that peaceful time was now at an end. While the Collingham's were drinking tea on the flagged terrace, and Jenny was on the ferry-boat, and Teddy dressing and skylarking after his plunge at the gym, and Follett nearing home, Lizzie was on her knees pinning up the draperies she was making over for Gussie. Pansy, the daughter of a bulldog and a Boston terrier, whose pansy face had it in it more than a human yearning, stood looking on, with four legs wide apart. Gussie was fifteen, pretty, pert, and impatient. "'Everybody'll see that it's the old thing you've been wearing since I don't know when.' According to this plaint, Lizzie thought it useless to reply. "'I'd rather not have a rag to wear than a thing everyone's sick of the sight of. Mamma, why can't I have a new dress right out and out?' "'My darling, you'll have a new dress when your father gets his raise. It must come before long, but I can't possibly give it to you till then.' "'I wish you'd stop talking.' came from Gladys, who was busy with her lessons in a corner. "'How can I study with all this row going on? Mamma, what's the meaning of coagulation?' 
evacuation explained, the fitting finished, and a dispute adjusted between the two children. Lizzie began to spread the table for supper, Gussie helping her. Most of the downstairs portion of the house being thrown into one large living room, the dining table stood at the end nearest to the kitchen and pantry. It was a pleasure to watch the supple movements of Gussie's figure, and the flittings of her slim-wristed hands as she took the plates and laid them in their places. Most people said she would one day be prettier than Jenny, but as yet there was only promise. Quite apparent was the fact that the mother had been more beautiful than any of her daughters was ever likely to become. At fifty-odd it was a beauty that still had youth in it. Worn with the duties of providing for a husband and four children, it retained a quality proud and aloof. In her scouring and cooking and endless domestic round, Lizzie was like an actress dressed and made up for a humble part rather than really living it. The Scarborough tradition, which had first refused to bend to king against people and again to yield to people against king, had survived in this woman fighting for her inner life against failure, poverty and sordidness. She was singing at her work when the front door opened and Josiah came in. He stood for a minute in the little entry, surveying the living room absently, while Pansy pranced about his feet. Gladys was still at her lessons, Gussie laying out the knives and forks. "'Where's your mother?' Gladys jumped up and ran to him. She was his youngest, his darling, just ever twelve. He'd always hoped to do better by her than by the older ones. "'Hello, Daddy!' With her arms round his neck, she was putting his face down to hers. "'Where's your mother?' he asked of Gussie, having advanced into the room. Gussie looked up from her task to inform him that her mother was in the kitchen, but seeing his grey face and shambling gait, she paused with a fork in her hand. "'You're all right, Daddy, aren't you?' The sound of voices having called Lizzie from her work, she stood on the threshold of the pantry, drying her hands on the corner of her apron. Before he said a word, she knew that the calamity which forever threatens those dependent on a weekly wage had fallen on the family. "'Lizzie, I'm fired.' She had never had to take a blow like this, not even when the three who came before Jenny had died in babyhood. This was the worst and hardest thing her imagination could conjure up, because it meant not only the sweeping away of their meagre income, but her husband's defeat as a man. Going to him, she laid her hands on his shoulders and tried to look into the eyes that avoided hers in shame. "'We'll meet it, Joe," she said quietly. "'We've been through other things. I've saved a little money ahead, nearly a hundred dollars. Don't feel badly. I'm glad you're out of Collingham and Laws, where you've said yourself that your desk was in a draft. You'll get another job, with bigger pay, and perhaps—' She sprang to the great joyous hope she was always cherishing— and perhaps Teddy will earn more money and be a great success. "'Hello, Ma!' Teddy himself was swinging down the room, Pansy capering round him with her silvery bark. Having tossed his cap on the sofa, he caught his mother in a bearish hug. Fresh from his bath, gleaming, ruddy, clear-eyed, stocky rather than short, he was a Herculean cub, the making of a man but as yet with no soul beyond play. No one had ever seen him serious. It was a drawback to him at Collingham and Laws, where he skylarked his way through everything. "'You must not the song and dance out of that young blood,' was Mr. Bickley's report on him, "'or he'll never earn his pay.' Before his mother could say anything, he was tickling her under the chin with little clicks of the tongue, Pansy assisting by springing halfway to his shoulder. The sport ended, he held her out at his strong arm's length, laughing down into her eyes. "'Good old Ma, the best ever!' "'What have you got for supper?' She told him as nearly as possible, as if nothing else was on her mind. Then she added, "'You've got to know, Teddy, darling. They've discharged your father from Collingham and Laws.' Confusedly, Teddy Follett knew he had received a summons, the call to be a man. Hitherto he had been a boy. He had thought himself a boy. He had called himself a boy. Even in the Navy he had been with boys who were treated as boys.' The pang of agony he felt now was that he was a boy still, with a man's part to play. He did his best to play it on the instant. "'Oh, is he? 
"'And that's all right. I'll be making more money soon, and be able to swing the whole thing.' Gussie was here, the discordant element. "'You've got to make it pretty quick, then, and be smarter than you've ever been before.' He turned away from the group in which his mother watched him with adoring eyes, while his father stood with gaze cast down like a criminal. "'I'm sorry to put the burden on you at your age, my boy,' he said brokenly. "'But perhaps I may get another job, after all, and a little pay better.' Teddy didn't hear this, not that he was so far away, but because he was listening to that call which seemed so impossible to respond to. He would have to be a man— he would have to earn big money. At the present, he didn't see how. Fifty bucks a week, he was saying to himself, was hardly enough to run the family, and he had only eighteen. He was standing with his back to them all, his hands in his pockets, when the front door opened again. Jenny came in, all aglow and abloom, after her walk from the street cars. "'Well, what's the pose?' she asked briskly of Teddy, beginning to take off her jacket. "'He ought to be modelled to a sculptor.' Jen, he whispered hoarsely before she could join the others. Pa's fired. To take this information in, Jenny paused with her arms still outstretched in the act of taking off her jacket. Do you mean they don't want him any more at Collingham and Laws? That's the right number. But, but what are we going to do? That's for you and me to say. It's up to us, Jen. Pa'll never get another job, not on your life, unless it's running a lift. We've got to shoulder it, you and me, between us. Jenny passed on into the room and down to the group round the table. The glow had gone out of her cheeks, but she was free from her brother's dismay. To begin with, she was a woman, and he was only a man. All his adventures would have to be dull ones in the line of work, whereas hers... She could hear Ray saying, as he had said only two hours ago, You could marry Bob Collingham if you wanted to. She didn't want to, as far as that went. But if the worst were to come to the worst, they should be in need of bread. "'Hello, Mother. Hello, Daddy.' Jenny was quite self-possessed. "'Teddy's been telling me. Too bad, isn't it? But something will turn up. What is there for supper, Gus?' Gussie minced round the table, putting on the salt cellars. "'There's pickled hummingbirds for princesses,' she said witheringly. "'After that there'll be honeydew jam.' "'Then I'll go up and take my hat off.' This coolness had the inspiring effect of an officer's calm on a sinking ship. It was an indication that life could go on as usual, and if life could go on as usual, all wasn't lost. "'And for mercy's sake,' Jenny added, turning to leave them, "'don't everybody look so glum. Why, if you knew what I could tell you, you'd all be ordering champagne.' So they were tidied over the dreadful minute— which meant that they found power to go on with the preparation for supper, and to sit down to supper itself. There the old man cheered up sufficiently to be able to tell what had passed between him and the head of the firm. He was still doing this when Teddy sprang to his feet, striking the table with a blow that made the dishes jump. "'God damn Bradley Collingham!' he cried with his mouth full. "'I'll do something to get even with him yet, if I have to go to the chair for it.' "'Sit down, you great gump, talking like that!' Gussie pulled her brother by the coat till he sank back into his seat. "'Mamma, you should send him away from the table!' "'That's a very wicked thing to say, my boy,' Josiah was beginning. "'Let him talk as he likes,' the mother broke in calmly. "'Going to the chair can't be so terrible, if you have a reason.' She went on carving as if she had said nothing strange. "'Well, Ma, I call that the limit,' Jenny commented. "'Oh, no, it isn't,' the mother returned, with the new strength which seemed to have come to her within half an hour. "'I'm ready to say a good deal more.' She looked adoringly towards Teddy, who, after his outburst, had returned sheepishly to his plate, while Pansy stood apart from them all, wise, yearning, and yet implacable, a little doggy fate. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of The Empty Sack by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. 
Chapter 5 No difference of standard in the Collingham household was so obvious as that between Dauphin, the Irish setter, and Max, the police dog. The situation was specially hard on Dauphin. To have owned Collingham Lodge and its occupants during all his conscious life, and then one day to find himself obliged to share this dominion with a stranger, had given him, in his declining years, a pessimistic point of view. It had made him proud, cold, withdrawn, like a crusty old aristocrat forced in among base company. To the best of his ability he ignored the police dog, though it was difficult not to be aware of the presence of a being too exuberant to appreciate disdain. For Dauphin, the most beastly experience of the day began about four each afternoon, at the minute when the dog clock told him that his master might be expected home. That was the hour at which, from time immemorial, he had taken possession of the great front portico, where the distant burr of the motor-car first reached him. When the burr became a throb, he knew it was passing the oak that marked the Collingham boundary, and, since it had arrived on his own ground, he could run down the driveway to meet it. This had been his exclusive right. To be joined daily now by a frisky, irrepressible pup made him feel like an old man tied to an insupportable young wife from whom his own death would be the sole deliverance. Life to Dauphin had thus become a mingling of impatience and anguish, poorly masked beneath an air of dignity. And as far as he could judge, his master's wife, of whom he had no great opinion, had begun to share these emotions. Anguish and impatience had become of late the chief elements in the aura she threw out, and by which dogs take their sense of men. It was not that her words or expressions betrayed her. It was only that, when she came within his sphere of perception, he was aware that she felt the kind of passion the police dog aroused in himself. He was aware of it on this May afternoon, more than six months after she had first learned of Bob's infatuation for the Follett girl, when she came out on the portico to listen for the expected car. She would come out, listen, and go back in. Each time she came out, each time she listened, each time she retired, he felt the sweeping to and fro of an imperious will, worried or frustrated, though he sat on his haunches and gave no sign. He couldn't give a sign, because Max would misunderstand it. There he was, down on the lawn before the portico, grinning, prancing, joking, calling names, names quite audible in dog intercourse, though a human being couldn't catch them, and the least little movement Dauphin made would be taken as concession. The old setter was sorry. He would have liked showing his master's wife, he didn't consider his mistress, that he understood her distress, but he was nailed to the doorstep by force majeure. And the woman envied him. He was perfectly aware of that. She assumed that dogs had no social problems, all he had to do, she thought, was to sit and blink at the magnolias, hawthorns and lilacs, pursuing one another into bloom. All he had to think of was the uphill and down dale of the view before him, a haze of blue and green and rose melting to the mauve of hills. As a matter of fact, this was something like which was passing through her mind. A masterful woman, she was nevertheless reaching that point of self-pity where she envied the untroubled dogs. While she carried the cares of so many others, no one else carried hers. All through the winter she had had Edith and Bob on her mind, and now she had Bradley. On leaving for the bank that morning, he had been so terribly upset that she couldn't rest till knowing how he had got through his day. She was the more worried because of being entirely alone, and thus thrown in on herself. Edith had gone to stay with people in the Berkshires. Of that her mother was glad. She meant for the present to keep her there. With her queer ideas, she would only make her brother the more difficult to deal with, though she had not been difficult herself. Nearly seven months had passed, and yet her affair with Ailing was exactly where it had been in the previous October. That was the advantage of a girl, you could always tell where she stood. Edith was tenacious, but not defiant. Though capable of engaging herself to this young man, she would hardly marry him in face of her father's opposition. Bob, on the other hand, was not only headstrong, but unreasonable. He would marry the Follick girl if she would marry him, whatever might be the consequences. She, his mother, had it out with him, and he had said so. 
It was a terrible thing to have their whole domestic happiness hang on the whim of a creature like the Follett girl, but apparently it did. She had not spoken to Bob till Hubert Ray had surrendered all he had to tell. He had done this through a process of pumping, of which he himself had hardly been aware. Having ascertained that his New England connections were unexceptional, Junior had been attentive to him through the winter, making him feel that Collingham Lodge was a second home. What he didn't tell to her, he told to Edith, and what Edith knew, the mother had no great difficulty in finding out. Thus, when on the previous Saturday Bob was about to leave for a party on Long Island, they'd had the plain talk, which could no longer be deferred. They'd had it after lunch, seated on a bench overlooking the tennis court. They had come out, ostensibly, to talk over the sacrifice of the pink and white hawthorn, in the shade of which they sat in favour of extending the court, so that Bob and Edith could both have parties simultaneously. While the new court would be an improvement, they would regret the celestial flowering of the hawthorn whenever, as at present, it was May. "'Not that it would make so very much difference to your father and me,' Junior began, in a quavering tone, "'if things we are afraid of were to happen.' So the subject was opened up. Bod could only ask, what things? And his mother could only tell him. It's quite true, old lady, he confessed. You might as well know it first as last. Junior had not brought up her children without having learned that, while Edith could be controlled, Bob could only be managed. With Edith she could say, I forbid. With Bob it had to be, I suffer. Of course, dear, she said now, I'm your mother. "'and whatever you do I shall try to accept. "'It'll be hard, naturally, it's hard already, "'but you can count on me.' "'He took her hand and squeezed it. "'Thanks, old lady. "'Of course I can't answer for your father. "'You know for yourself how stern and unyielding he is.' "'Oh, I'm not so sure about that. "'It's always seemed to me that he'd give in to a lot of things "'if you'd only let him.' "'This perspicacity being dangerous, "'she glided to another aspect of her theme.' "'What I don't understand is why, if you've been in love with her for seven or eight months, "'and you mean to marry her, you haven't done it already.' "'He took two or three puffs at his cigarette before tossing off. "'I'd do it like a shot, if she would.' "'And she won't? Not yet. "'And you think she will? I'm sure she will. "'What makes you so certain?' "'Nothing. I just know.' "'Having had her fears verified,' Junior had no object in pushing the inquiry further. Her duty in life was to take events as they touched her family, and mould them for the best. When she called it the best, she meant it as the best. She was not a worldly woman with mere fashionable ends in view. Eager for the good of her children, she was conscientious in pursuit of the things she truly believed to be the worthiest. All through Sunday she took counsel with herself, going to communion at the restful little Marillo church and putting new intensity into her devotion. She had guests at lunch, and went out to dinner, and though equal to all the social demands, her mind did not relinquish the purpose she had in view. Could she have accomplished it without her husband's aid, she would probably not have taken him into her confidence. It being her special task to deal with the children, the less he knew of their mistakes and escapades, the simpler it was for them all. It may be an illuminating digression here to say that there had been a time, some fifteen years earlier, when Junior had had an experience as difficult as the one she was facing now. Nothing but a trained subconsciousness had carried her through that, and she looked for the same mainstay of the self to come to her aid again. One of the lessons she had learned at that time was the value of quietude, of reserve in giving herself away. She was not one to whom this restraint came natural, but for the very reason that it was acquired, it had the intenser force. It was at a time when they had lived in the Marilla house only a little while, and the Bradley of that day was not the portly, domesticated bigwig of the present. He was a tempestuous sea of passions right at the dangerous flood-tide, the middle forties. The first ardour of married life was at an end for both of them. But while, for her, existence was running more and more into one quiet, purposeful stream, for him it was raging off in new directions. Whatever Junior suspected, she was too wise to know it as a certainty. Knowing, she argued, would probably weaken her and do nothing to strengthen him. 
Already she was more intensely a mother than she was a wife, living in the amazing careers she was planning for her children. Edith would marry an English peer, while Bob would take a brilliant place in his own country. Their victories would be her victories, till, in some far-distant beatified old age, she would be translated to the stars. And then, one afternoon, when the flagged pavement had only recently been laid, and they were drinking tea on it, Bradley had said, right out of a clear sky, "'Junior, I don't know whether you've suspected it or not, but for some time past I've had a mistress.' That was the instant when she first learned the value of a schooled subconsciousness. It seemed to her that she had been slain, and yet, with a nerve little less than miraculous, she went on with her tasks among the tea-things. "'If you'd done it so far without telling me, Bradley,' she said at last, with only the slightest tremor in her tone, "'why shouldn't you let me remain ignorant?' "'Does that mean that you don't care if I go on?' "'I think you can answer that as well as I. "'What I don't care for is to be drawn into an affair from which your own good taste—' merely to put it on that ground, should be anxious to leave me out. He looked at her savagely. Don't you resent it any more than that? Is that why you're giving me the information, to see how much I resent it? Partly. Then I'm afraid you will have your labour for your pains. You'll never see more than you're seeing at this instant. That stand was a masterstroke. It gave her the advantage of being enigmatic. It enabled her to take blows without seeming to have felt them, and to deliver them without betraying the quarter from which the next would come. Right there and then, Bradley had been monstrous enough to suggest that, since she liked Collingham Lodge, she should remain there and let him go away. He would make generous provision for her and the children, and in return expect his divorce. But she had taken her stand— the enigmatic. She didn't argue, she didn't plead, she didn't reproach him. She didn't treat him to the scene through which weaker women would have put him. Bradley, I shall expect you to remain with me, were the only words she used. And he had remained. Less than two years later, it was she who fixed the sum the other woman was to be paid in order to get rid of her. She was sufficiently in sympathy with her sex to insist on the terms being liberal. "'I think she should have fifty thousand dollars,' she declared, and fifty thousand dollars the woman received. So that if Bradley had lost the first passion of his love for her, he had gained vastly in respect. Hot-tempered, high-handed, impetuous, imperious, as he knew her to be, he saw her curb and compress these qualities till they became a prodigious motor-force. If she had not mastered herself, she had mastered the expression of herself till she was an instrument at her own command. It was as an instrument at her own command that, on the Wednesday morning, before he went to town, she gave her husband as much information as she thought he ought to possess about his son. "'Would you mind sitting down for a minute, Bradley? I have something important to say.' He had come up to her room as she took her breakfast in bed, after he had had his own downstairs. Wearing a lace dressing-jacket and a boudoir cap, she was propped up with pillows, a wicker tray with legs on the coverlet before her. In the canopied Louis Carr's bed of an old rich-grained walnut, raised six inches above the floor, she suggested an eighteenth-century French princess, Madame Sophie or Madame Victoire, receiving a courtier at her levée. Luxurious, with a note of chastity, was the rest of the chintzy room. The pictures on the wall were sacred ones, copies of old Italian masters. A prédieu in a corner supported a Bible and a prayer-book in tooled bindings with a coat of arms. The white-panelled wardrobe room, seen through a door ajar, was also austere as a well-kept sacristy. Perfumed air came in through the opened windows, and thrushes were fluting in the trees. Reminding her that Tim's, the chauffeur, would soon be at the door to take him to the bank, Collium sank into the armchair nearest to the bed. His thoughts were on the amount of the proposed issue of Paraguayan bonds the house would be able to carry. "'It's about Bob,' she began, in a tone little more than casual. "'Did you know he was in a scrape?' He started, firing off his brief questions rapidly. "'Who? Bob? What kind of scrape? With a girl?' "'Exactly. With a girl who may give us a good deal of trouble unless the thing is stopped.' 
if Collingham's heart sank, it was not wholly because of the scrape of the girl, but because he was afraid of chickens coming home to roost. Though he had never broached the subject with the boy, he had often wondered as to how he met sexual temptation, and now he was to learn. "'Is it anything very wrong?' "'Only an intention.' She sipped her coffee before letting him have the full force of it. "'He wants to marry her.' He felt some slight relief. "'Oh, then it's not. No, not as far as he's concerned. As to her, well, I presume that she's the usual type.' "'Did he tell you himself?' "'He told me himself.' "'His job at the bank pays him only two thousand dollars a year. Did he say what else he expected to marry on?' "'We didn't discuss that, but I suppose it would be what he expects you to give him.' "'And if I don't give him anything?' "'That's what I wanted to know. If you didn't—' "'He'd call it off.' "'No, perhaps not. But she would.' "'Have you any special reason for thinking so?' "'None, but my knowledge of—of of that kind of woman in general.' She went on as quietly as if the incident of fifteen years previously had never occurred. Men are so guileless about women who have who have love to sell. They are such simpletons. They so easily think these women like them for themselves, and all the while they are only gauging the measure of the pocket-book. Collingham endeavoured not to hang his head, but it seemed to go down in spite of him, as the splacid voice sketched his programme for the day. Junior had heard her husband say that Mr. Huntley, his second-in-command, was to go to South America in connection with the issue of Paraguayan bonds. Why shouldn't Bob be sent with him? It would add to his experience and make him feel important. After he had left Asuncion, reasons could be found for keeping him at Lima, Rio, or Buenos Aires, till the whole thing blew over. Having accepted the suggestion gratefully, Collium came to the question he had up to now repressed. "'Who is the girl? I suppose you know.' "'She's been posing for Hubert Ray. Bob met her at the studio. Her name is—' Grasping the arms of the chair, he strained forward. "'Not—not not Follett's girl?' "'Yes, that is the name. You dismissed her father from the bank last year.' Her eyes followed him as he stumbled to his feet. "'But what difference does it make whether it's she or someone else?' He couldn't tell her. The fear of the vague nemesis he called chickens coming home to roost was too obscure. Listening in a daze to the rest of his instructions, he seized them, chiefly because they would ease the line he was to take with Bob. He was to give him no hint that he, the father, had heard anything of the Follett girl. The South American mission could stand on its own merits as extremely flattering. Whatever reluctance Bob might feel, he would see the opportunity as too important to forego. All Junior begged of her husband was to know nothing of Bob's love affairs. If Bob himself brought the subject up, it would be enough to remain firm on the question of money. Of the rest, Junior was willing to take charge, as she would explain to him when he came home in the afternoon. These instructions Collingham did his best to carry out. At lunch, in the house's private room at the Bowling Green Club, he approached Mr. Huntley on the subject of being responsible for Bob on the errand to Asuncion and Mr. Huntley expressed himself as delighted. On returning to the bank, Collingham asked Miss Ruddick to bring the young man to the private office. "'Hello, Bob. How are things going?' Uh, "'So-so, Dan?' Bob admitted, guardedly. "'Sit down. I want to talk to you.' Bob sat down gingerly, warily, scenting something in the wind, much like Max or Dauphin from a person's atmosphere. Whatever his mother had been told on Saturday— his father might have learned by Wednesday. Bob would have been sure of this, were it not that his mother often had curious reserves. For Collium there was nothing to do but to plunge on the subject of South America, and he plunged. But in his dread of the roosting chicken, he plunged nervously, with a tendency to redden, to, to stammer, and otherwise to betray himself. Before he had finished, Bob was saying inwardly, Mother's put him wise to Jenny, and I'm to be packed off. "'Well, we'll see.' "'It's something good of you, Mr. Huntley, Dad,' he said aloud, "'and I suppose it would do if I gave you my answer in a day or two. "'That's the girl,' the father thought. "'But he bade Junior's injunction as to not being explicit when it came to words. "'You see, it's this way, Bob. 
it's not exactly an invitation that I give you. It's a, it's a, a decision of the bank of which you're an employee. We take it for granted that you'll go if you, we wanted to send you. And I take it for granted that you won't send me if I don't want to go. Not to force the issue, Collingham left the matter there, preferring to consult Junior as to what he should do next. To this end, he drove home earlier than usual. It added to Dofar's irritation that Max should hear the motor first. With ears cocked like a donkey's, how could he help it? There was nothing in the world that Dauphin despised as he despised the police dog's ears. They were forever pointed, alert, inquisitive, ignoble. But there it was. Max was bounding down the driveway, covering yards at a spring, before the setter could drag himself from his haunches. It was Max, too, who, when the motor passed the oak, gave the first yelp of delight. But it was Dauphin, who, as his master descended from the car, entered into his depression. It was he, too, who perceived the conflict of auras when wife and husband met. Waves of unreasoned dread on the one side encountered a force of clear-eyed determination on the other, as the weltering sea comes up against the steadfast rocks. They began talking as they turned to enter the house, continuing the conversation within the great hall, where only the strip of red carpet running its length and up the fine stairway, two or three bits of old carved English oak, and the brass touches on the wrought-iron baluster, relieved the admirable nudity. "'Now come in here,' she said briskly, having heard all that had passed between him and Bob. He followed her into the library, where she led the way to the desk. "'Read that!' He ran his eyes over the lines written in her legible, decorative hand. Collingham Lodge, Marillo Park. Dear Miss Follett, my husband and I would be greatly obliged if you could give us a half-hour of your time to talk over matters which may prove as important to you as to us. If you could make it convenient to come here tomorrow, Thursday afternoon, you would find a very good train at 3.25 and one by which to return at 5.47. I enclose a timetable and you will be met at Marillo Station. Your sincerely, Junior Collingham. He looked at her wonderingly. What's the big idea? A very big idea, don't you see? We can cut the ground right from under his feet without his ever thinking we have anything to do with it. You personally need me supposed to know that this nonsense has ever been in the air. It's too late for me, of course, because he and I have already talked of it. But for you... He tapped the paper in his hand. "'But this move I don't understand. "'Well, sit down, and I'll tell you.' End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of The Empty Sack by Basil King. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Recording by Simon Evers. "'Chapter 6 at the minute when Junior Collingham was laying before her husband a plan which would bring comparative wealth to the Follett family, a number of things were happening in and about New York. First, Lizzie Follett had dropped into a chair to think, an action rare with her. She generally thought as she whisked about her work, but this problem called for concentration. Briefly, it was as to how to cook the supper without heat. The gas man had just gone away, and the gas for the range had been cut off because she couldn't pay a bill of $29.67 or anything on account. This was Wednesday, and she would have no more money till the children got their various pay envelopes on Saturday. Though in the back of her mind she blamed herself for an unwise distribution of the week's funds, it was one of those situations in which you blame yourself without seeing how you could have done otherwise. With six to feed, and all the subsidiary expenses of a family to meet, she had twenty-two dollars a week. Of his eighteen, Teddy gave her fifteen, three being needed for car fares and other small necessities. From the six she earned at the studio, Jenny contributed three. Gladys, who was now a cash girl on seven a week, was able to turn in four. Gussie brought nothing to the common fund as yet, for the reason that the three-fifty which Madame Corinne conceded for the privilege of a teaching her the millinery allowed no margin over what she had to spend. To Lizzie, during the past six months, life had become an exciting game. How to pay the minimum on every account, and yet keep alive her credit, had been the calculation with which she rose in the morning and lay down at night. 
It was a game that could be played successfully for two months, or three months, or four. When it came to six, the heaping up of unpaid balances made it harder to go on. It was making it impossible to go on. During the past fortnight she had found her credit stopped at three places in the square, where Pemberton Heights did its shopping. In vain she had tried to transfer her account elsewhere. But Pemberton Heights is no more than a huge village where the status of most families is known. More and more her small amount of cash was needed for cash purposes, in order that the family might live. Lizzie sat down to cast up her assets. She had the small remnants of a ham which could be eaten cold. She had bread and butter. If she could only make tea. She might have done that in a neighbour's house, but she shrank from exposing a situation which a lucky stroke might change. At the same moment Josiah was turning away from a wooden bar which shut off an office from the public. He had entered and stood there, meek, unobtrusive, trembling, while none of the young men or young women busy at desks or with one another paid him any attention. When a girl with hair combed over her ears, very bright eyes and very short skirts, tripped by him accidentally, he managed to stammer out something in which she caught the word job. The word being significant, and Josiah's appearance more so, she whispered to a gentleman who left his desk and came forward. "'No, I'm very sorry. We can't do anything for you.' He hadn't waited for the word job. He hadn't waited for Josiah to speak at all. He knew the situation so well that his method was to end it there and then. Josiah turned away meekly as he had entered, and with no sinking of the heart. His heart used to sink, but that was four and five months previously before he had exhausted his emotions. Now the bitterness of death was past. It had passed day by day and inch by inch, by stages of slow agony, leaving him with a dried soul that couldn't suffer any more. And also at this minute Teddy was standing in his cage at the bank in a very peculiar situation. At least it struck him as peculiar, because for the first time he perceived its opportunities. For Teddy, too, six months had been a period of development, just as it is for a green fruit when you pick it and lay it in the sun. It ripens, but it ripens green. When you eat it, it has a green flavour, or a flat flavour, or none at all. Teddy was a fruit to be left on the tree to take its time. He was now twenty-one, with the promptings of sixteen. At his own rate of progress he would probably have reached twenty by the time he was twenty-two, but thirty at twenty-five. As it was, he had been called on to be thirty when his growth was just beginning. Not merely the circumstances have made this demand in him, but the dependence, more or less unconscious, of the members of the family. They looked to him to do something big, because he was a young man. Having heard of other young men who had been financially heroic, they expected him to be the same. The possibilities, open to a bank clerk of twenty-one, had no relation to their hopes. Even his mother, chiefly because of her adoration, seemed to feel that he should spring from eighteen to a hundred dollars a week by the force of inner flame. She didn't say so, of course. She only revealed her sentiments as Pansy revealed hers, by an inextinguishable look. The father did no more than throw emphasis on the boy's responsibility. Jenny and Gladys never said anything at all. But Gussie was quite frank. "'A great big fellow like you and only making eighteen per. Look at poor Mamma working her fingers to the bone. I'd be ashamed if I were you. Why, Fred Ingalls orders his clothes at Love's and, and keeps his own Ford.' It was all there in a nutshell, his inability to rise to the occasion in a land where everyone else who was worth his salt had only to shake the money-tree and pick up coin. How Fred Ingalls did it, Teddy couldn't think, when your value by the week was so definitely fixed and a raise lay so far ahead. If he had developed during the past six months, it was mainly through a carking sense of inefficiency. Meanwhile, he had to do what Gussie told him, watch his mother work her fingers to the bone. In spite of a tendency to squabble, the Follets were an affectionate family, and the mother was the centre of their love. Teddy didn't stop to analyse what she was to them. He only knew that there was nothing he wouldn't be to her. If he could only have compassed it, she would have had a bar-pin like their neighbour, Mrs. Weatherby. She would have worn the skunk neckpiece for which she had once heard her utter a desire. She would have gone out in his ford oftener than Fred Ingalls' mother in his. These things he would have done for her, and more— 
had he been but the financial titan all-American example had called on him to become. Between Gus's taunts and his own, what lack I yet, he was reaching a condition of despair. And now, on this particular afternoon, when nearly everyone had left the bank, and Mr. Brunt, to whom he was specially attached, was working later than usual, there was the fruit of the money-tree piled up on the ground. Mr. Brunt had gone to the other end of the main office, and would return presently to stow these piles of bills in the safe. These bills were money. Teddy had never consciously dwelt on that fact before. He had been in this same situation a thousand times, when he had nothing to do but put out his hands and stuff his pockets with food and fuel and gas and the interest on the mortgage, and all the other things of which there was such a lack at home, and had never considered that the needed things were here. He remembered that as a child in Nova Scotia he would occasionally swipe an apple from a cartload, knowing that the owner couldn't miss it, and had the same sensation now. Here were the piles of bills, all arranged in rows according to their values, a pile of hundreds, a pile of fifties, a pile of twenties, and so on down. Mr. Bump would come back, as he had done at other times, and put them away without counting them. Having counted them already, he would accept this reckoning for the day. He, Teddy, was left there to see that nothing happened to this treasure. He was never able to tell how it came about. Without seemingly being able to control the action of his hand, he had slipped a twenty-dollar bill from the top of the pile into his own pocket. It was an instant's weakness, followed the next instant by repentance. Teddy knew what theft was. He had not, through his father, had so much to do with banks without being fully aware of the sure and pitiless punishment meted out to it. He didn't mean to steal. He was horror-stricken at the act. Quick as a flash, his hand went into his pocket again. But Mr. Brunt was back. The thing that could have been done at once had to be deferred. Looking for a chance to drop the bill to the floor and make restitution by picking it up, it was annoying that Mr. Brunt should give him none. Mr. Brunt seemed possessed by a demon of speed. So quickly had he locked all the piles in the safe, and then locked the cage behind him. Teddy found himself outside, with the bill still burning in his pocket. Even so, there were other possibilities. Going to the washroom, he hung on there till Mr. Brunt had gone home. The cage was made of open wirework. It was a simple thing to slip a bill through one of the interstices. It would be found next morning on the floor, and a fresh running over accounts would show where it belonged. Mr. Brunt would wonder how he came to be so careless, but with his balance straight he would be satisfied. But, as Teddy reached the cage, there was Doolan, the night watchman. Doolan was an ex-policeman, too old for public office, but equal to sounding an alarm in case the bank was being robbed. He was a friendly soul, and, in strolling up to Teddy, had no motive beyond asking about the old man and whether or not he'd yet found a job but Teddy suspected that he was being watched. He didn't know but that Doolan might have seen the movement of the hand which snatched the bill from the pile. When he stirred to go homeward, Doolan might clutch him by the neck. It was a strange, new sensation to feel that, within a minute, within a few seconds, the law might have its grip on him. Having said good-bye to Doolan and turned away, he took the first steps in expectation of a stern command to come back. It was another strange new sensation to be walking the familiar ways of Broad Street and Wall Street with this strange new consciousness. There were thousands of bright young men and women streaming to electrics, subways and ferries in the first stages of commuting, and among them he bore a secret mark. Tramping along in the crowd, he felt like a soldier marching with his comrades to the trenches, but knowing himself picked for death. Luckily his folly was not even now beyond reparation. He would get to the bank early in the morning, discover the cursed bill lying in some artfully chosen corner of the floor, and restore it to Mr. Brunt. All the same, it was a relief to get away from the fear of detection which he felt to be haunting the streets, by plunging into the moor of the subway, where his identity was swallowed up. At this minute, too, in the studio, Hubert Ray was leaning over Jenny Follett's shoulder, and placing before her a rough pencil sketch. "'Take it away!' "'Jenny cried tearfully. "'I don't want to look at it.' "'But, Jenny, I only wish you to see how little it involves.' "'It was a drawing of a nude woman, "'her hair coiled on the top of her head, 
sitting very upright in a marble Byzantine chair, her knees pressed together in the manner of the Egyptian cat goddess. On a level with her face, and poised on the tips of her fingers, she held a human skull which she inspected with slanting, mysterious eyes. Ray continued to keep the sketch before Jenny, hanging over her shoulder. He was so close that she felt his breath on her neck. He could easily have pressed his lips against her amber-coloured hair, and Jenny wished he would. But having long ago made up his mind that she could be best be won by a system of starving out, he refrained from doing it. As, however, she persisted in brushing the sketch aside, he straightened himself up. "'Then, Jenny, I'm afraid I can't use you any more. That is, for the present. Since you won't do it, I must get someone who will.' "'You could paint another kind of picture,' she argued indignantly, "'with me with clothes on.' "'You don't understand. I'm an artist. An artist doesn't paint the picture he chooses, but the one that's given him to paint.' "'No one gave you this to paint. It isn't a commission. It's just your own bad mind.' "'I'm not ready to explain what it is. You wouldn't understand. "'Something comes to you. You've got to obey it. "'This is the picture I've seen and which I'm obliged to do next. "'And besides, it isn't a bad mind, Jenny. "'The human form is the most— "'Oh, you don't have to hand me out any hokum about the human form. "'It's all very well in its place. "'But you fellows are crazy, the way you stick it up where it doesn't belong. "'Look at that picture of Simsies you were all so wild about. Three men were walking in a field and not a stitch between them. "'Who go out like that? There's no sense in it.' "'It isn't a question of sense, Jenny. It's one of business. "'If you want to be a model, you must be a model and meet the demands of the market.' "'She wore the cheap linen suit that had been her best last summer, and the corresponding hat. "'But her beauty, being of the type which subordinates externals to itself, "'she was more than adorable. She was elegant.' With tears still rolling down her cheeks, she pointed at the sketch Ray held in his hand as he stood before her at a distance. "'Do you know what my father would do if he thought I was going to be painted like that? He'd turn me out of doors.' Ray tossed the sketch on the table. "'Then, Jenny, there's no use talking of it any more. You're not that kind of model, and if it's that kind of model I'm looking for.' "'I'm the kind of model you were looking for when you put that advertisement in the paper nearly a year ago.' I answered it because you said a, a pretty girl, not a professional. Yes, that was a year ago. That's what I wanted then. But now it's something else. It doesn't follow that because you're satisfied with an egg for breakfast that an egg will be enough for every meal all the rest of your life. She looked up reproachfully. Yes, all the rest of your life. That's the way you talk. Nothing will ever be enough for you all the rest of your life. No, Jenny, nothing. Not as far as I see now. "'And yet you expect me to stake everything?' "'You must choose your words there, Jenny. "'I don't expect you to do anything. "'There may have been a time when I hoped, but that's all over. "'We won't talk of it. "'You've made up your mind. I must make up mine. "'There's nothing between us now but a question of business. "'I'm looking for a model who does this kind of thing, "'and it doesn't suit you to serve my turn. "'Well, that settles it, doesn't it? "'Our little account is paid up to date, and so—' "'She stumbled to her feet.' The only form her resentment took was a trembling of the lip and the streaming of more tears. "'But what can I do?' "'Do you mean for a living?' As she nodded speechlessly, he smiled with a faint shrug of the shoulders. "'That's not for me to decide, is it, Jenny? Once you've left me—' "'I'm not leaving you. You're driving me away.' "'Suppose we said that life was separating us. Wouldn't that express it better? We've, we've liked each other.' "'I've never made any secret of it on my side, have I, Jenny? "'No, you're so terribly discreet on yours. "'And yet life... "'I've only been discreet about one thing. "'But that one thing is the whole business. "'And I wouldn't be discreet about that if there was any other way. "'There's the way I told you about. "'Yes, and be left high and dry after two or three years, "'neither one thing nor the other. "'Isn't that looking pretty far ahead?' "'It's not looking farther ahead than a girl has to. "'It's easy enough to talk. "'There you'd be, able to walk off without a sign on you, "'whereas I'd have to lie down and die or, or find someone else.' "'Well, there'd be that possibility, wouldn't there? "'That's not so difficult for a pretty girl to find when—' "'She stamped her foot. "'I hate you!' "'No, no, you don't, Jenny. 
You love me. Only you won't let yourself. And I never will. Never, never, never. Not if I was starving in the streets. So help me God. She was running towards the model's exit when he called after her. Then you leave me to work with another woman, Jenny. Another woman sitting in your place. Another woman. When she threw him a despairing glance, he snatched the sketch from the table and held it up to her. Another woman dressed like that. But out on the stairs she paused. Anger was giving place to fear. It was, first of all, a fear of the other woman dressed like that. And then it was a fear, not less agonising, of the loss of her six a week. Her six a week was all that stood between Jenny and the not very carefully veiled contempt of the family. In the testing to which the past half-year had subjected them all, Jenny had not made very good. Six a week had been her measure. For obscure reasons which none of them could fathom, she had proved incapable of really lucrative work. She had tried to get employment with other artists who would leave her free for her hours with Ray, but she had failed. She had failed, too, in stores, factories, offices, and dressmaking establishments. Perhaps they thought she was only half-hearted in her attempts. Perhaps her air of helplessness told against her. She was too much like a lady, had been one employer's verdict, and possibly that was true. Whatever the reason, she seemed a creature not primarily meant to work, but to be utilised in some other way. The question was as to that way. "'You're splendid to love,' little Gladys had whispered one day, when Jenny was crying to herself, and much in her recent experience confirmed this opinion. In her applications for something to do, it had more than once been made plain to her that money could be made by other means than by punching a time-clock at seven. But she couldn't retrace her steps and go back to Ray. She thought of it. She had chosen to descend by the stairs instead of by the lift which served the huge studio building, in order to give herself the chance of changing her mind. She went down a few steps and stood still, then a few more steps and stood still. If it had been only a question of the money, she might have swallowed her pride and returned to throw herself at his feet. But there was the other woman, dressed like that. He had dared to invoke her. Well, let him invoke her. Let him paint her. Let him do anything he liked. She, Jenny, would break her heart over it, but it would be easier to break her heart than go back. And yet, not to go back, made her feet like lead, as she dragged herself down the interminable steps. End of chapter 6